take our Bibles and let's open to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, as we continue studying through the longest psalm in the Bible, Psalm 119, and we're going to be looking at the sixth part, uh, and uh, we're going to be looking at the, the section verses 41 through 48, which is acrostic, which corresponds to the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. How do we pronounce that letter? Vav, I believe, <laughs> is how we say it. And so uh, uh, let's, let's look at that together and read it from the Word of God together. It says, Let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. So shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your ordinances. So shall I keep your law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. I will speak of your testimonies also before kings, and will not be ashamed. I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I will lift up to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Can we pray together tonight? God, we just ask you, Lord, to bless the reading and the study of your word this evening, Lord, and that, Father, that you might speak to our hearts, that you might build us up in your word, Father, that you might forgive us of all our sins, Lord, that you might have mercy upon us tonight and fill this place with your Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit and minister to us tonight, build us up in your word, Strengthen us in your word and help us follow you. We pray and we ask these things in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as we look at this section of this psalm tonight, uh, it's a little unique. We see two characters as we, as we read through it. And, 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 when, and when I say that, we, aside from the Lord to whom David is praying, we see two other characters aside from the Lord. The first one is the believer, and, uh, which in this case is David himself. He's the, he's the believer. And all of us who are believers, we can identify with David here. That is, as long as we share the same attitudes and desires towards God's Word, the same priorities that David possesses as that we see here in this section of the psalm. We can sort of put ourselves in David's shoes here. We can put ourselves in David's place. We're the believers as we look at this section. We're the one, ones who believe God's word. We're the ones who love God's word. We're the ones who, 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 who take, uh, take care to know God's word, and we believe that God's word is going to get us through. So, so this first character, uh, you know, whether you want to think about him as David or whether you want to think about him as yourself by putting yourself into David's position, this first character is the believer who loves God's word. That's, that's the, f the first part. Now, the second character in the story is the unbeliever, and he despises God's word. He uh, ridicules God's word. He, he makes fun of God's word. Anybody know anybody like that? Uh, you, you, of course, you've seen people like that. Maybe you don't personally know, most of us do personally know somebody who just doesn't believe God's word. But there are people who not only just don't believe it, they, they ridicule it. They hate God's Word. They ridicule any person who believes in God's Word. Uh, they uh, no more believe in Jesus Christ than they believe in the Easter Bunny. Uh, and, and, and the unbeliever, and I hope I didn't break any hearts just now letting that cat out of the bag. But the, the unbeliever is in the midst here of an argument with the believer in this section of this psalm. The unbeliever is, is arguing. The unbeliever is saying the Word of God is not true. The Word of God is not reliable. And the believer is uh, defending God's Word. Not, and not that we have to defend God's Word, but we proclaim the goodness of God's Word. And, and again, that is the spirit of this psalm from beginning to end. Psalm 119, is, that's our title. What is it? The Wonderful Word of God. This, that's the theme all the way from the beginning. God's word is wonderful. His, his ordinances, his, his precepts, his commandments, his word, his law. It's a wonderful 
gift that God has given us, and it is good, and it is reliable, and it instructs us, and it leads us, and it lights our way, and it gives us life. We're seeing that, and we, we see the believers standing on that here in the section. So, so that's what we have here, is that the believer and the unbeliever are in the midst of a dispute. The believer is saying God's word is not reliable. The, the, the believer is saying, yes, it is. It is true, and it's reliable, and it's good. And there's this argument going on, this dispute going on. And the believer is praying to God, and he's praying for God to, to help him in such a way that it will be so obvious, so clear that it is God coming through and bringing this help, and it'll be so obvious as that it's, it's that the, the believer cannot lose this argument. You remember the arguments we used to have on the playground when we were kids, you know? Yeah. And you get into a fight with somebody, and, and, and whenever you just you get into an argument with somebody and you just don't like them, you know, you start, I don't know why boys do this or, or whatever, but my dad is bigger than your dad, you know? That was kind of the thing, you know? Uh, because, you know, dad, I guess dad's come in to solve problems for us or whatever, but my dad uh, is smarter than your dad. My dad makes more money than your dad or, or whatever. But in this, in, in this case, it's true. Our father is greater than any father. And, uh, and, and we ought to believe that. Maybe that's just a natural thing God put into us, that we should trust our father. We should have great confidence in our father. We should know that our father is the greatest father that there is. Talking about our heavenly father. And... Uh, so the, the believer is praying to God, I want you to help me because this guy is ridiculing me. He is ridiculing your word. And I want you to help me in such a clear and evident way that I will be able to look at him and he won't be able to answer after you have, have, have poured out your mercy and your, your salvation on me. That's what we're going to see here. So that's the first point of, of this psalm we're going to see four kind of clear divisions here. The first thing is the prayer of the believer. Let's look down, look at this prayer here. Look at what he asked the Lord. He says, let your mercies come also to me, O Lord. And notice the word mercies there. Uh, the word mercies, we, we hear the word mercy a lot. And what other word do we hear a lot in conjunction with the word mercy? Grace, mercy, mercy. And grace, and it's become kind of a popular statement in our day in, in churches. I've heard a lot of, I've heard it a lot. Uh, people say that grace is when God gives you the good things that you don't deserve, but mercy is when God doesn't give you the bad things that you do deserve. How many of you have, have you have ever heard that statement before? And that's a, that that's a pretty good. Pretty fair statement. It's pretty. It's pretty true. Uh, pretty good statement. I, I I know that to be very accurate in my own life. God has definitely given me uh, all kinds of good things, good blessings, and good things that I do not deserve. Beginning with my salvation, most of all, I do not deserve my salvation. And on the other hand, you know, God has, in his mercy, uh, God has absolutely withheld from me a lot of the really bad things that I do deserve. And I'm most thankful to him for withholding his wrath from me, which I deserve, and, and not condemning me to spend an eternity in the lake of fire like I deserve. And that's a good little statement that gives us a little insight into the meaning of grace and mercy. But when you see the word mercies here, this is from the Hebrew word chesed. We saw it just a few weeks ago, I think, when we were going through Psalm 118, I believe it was. And, and we, we see that word chesed there when it speaks of the everlasting, never failing. Most of the time chesed is, is translated with two words because it's just hard to kind of pinpoint the, the full meaning of it here. Uh, when we see the, the hesed, it's, it's the never-failing covenant love and mercy, mercies that God pours out. And this kind of mercy, it's connected to God's covenant. It's mercy that can never be taken away because it's been guaranteed by the everlasting covenant that God established with us. The, 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 the covenant, you know, you, you begin to see the hesed when God established his covenant with Abraham. And you ask, well, well, what if Abraham breaks his part of that covenant? No, Abraham 
cannot break that covenant because Abraham did nothing to establish the covenant. This was a one-way covenant which God made to Abraham while Abraham was asleep. Right? God put him into a, a sleep, a deep sleep, and just let him kind of through dim eyes see his glory pass through between the pieces of those animals. So Abraham cannot break this covenant. He didn't do, establish it. Abraham cannot break it. And God will not break it because God never breaks his covenant. God never makes a, a, a covenant or a promise or, or, or says anything that he, that he won't fulfill. He always keeps his covenant. And that's the kind of unfailing, unbreakable covenant mercy that the psalmist is praying for here in the very beginning of this section of the psalm. And as he, as he continues, of course, those mercies are connected with his salvation. He says, he says uh, let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation. Your salvation. And that word salvation is from a Hebrew word, teshua, which that, that word is very, it's, it's, it's a Hebrew word for deliverance, and it's very closely connected to the Hebrew name Yeshua, which is the Hebrew name for Jesus. And uh, we see that a lot in the scripture. And, and, and it's, it's, it, it says a lot that even when we just look at the word salvation itself, that God delivers us, God saves us. When we look at that word throughout the Old Testament, it is always closely connect, connected to or it is spoken by, we're reminded of the name of Jesus, or it is actually the name of Jesus that's there throughout the Old Testament. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Jesus, our salvation. And uh, so we see that here. That's the prayer of the believer in the beginning of this section. He is asking God to provide for him his unfailing covenant mercy. Pour it out on me. And with the salvation, the deliverance that you pour out, the, and, and he says it's according to your word. This is the salvation. This mercy and the salvation has been promised in God's word. Pour w what you promised out on me, your mercy and your salvation. And when you do that, O oh Lord, when you pour that out, O oh Lord, I believe I'm going to have everything I need to answer the goofball that's trying to make my life ridiculously more difficult by denying your promises when you do fulfill that promise when you do fulfill that covenant to me then I'm gonna have my answer that's kinda of the the idea we begin with and so the second thing we see here in this psalm is the persecution of the believer and in verse number 42 he says you know he's already said if you pour out your mercy on me pour out your salvation on me that you promised in your word he says, so shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me. Now that word reproaches, it comes from the Hebrew word karaf, and it means to pull off. Does anybody understand what that means, to pull off? This communicates the idea of ripping, stripping someone's clothes off and to expose their nakedness in order to humiliate them. If you remember in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, as soon as they sinned, right, they knew what? They were naked. Right. And the proper pronunciation is not naked, it's naked, right? The way Bridget says it, naked. Okay. Um, but uh, they were ashamed, right? They were filled with shame because of it. And, and, and what does this remind us of? Someone's Close. It, it, what it brings my mind to is that at Calvary, when, when Christ was put on trial and being condemned, well, they stripped his robe off him. They stripped him naked. They nailed him to a cross in order to shame him as much as they possibly could, to humiliate him. And that's what our psalmist is describing to us. And we, we see Christ every time we look back at these psalms. We see in the suffering of David... Brother Nate preached Sunday morning, as we suffer with joy, and trusting God, the world sees Christ. And that's an example of it right here. In David's suffering, we see the suffering of Christ. They, they tried to shame him. The, the world is trying, the, the lost unbeliever is trying to 
reproach David, to humiliate David. He's trying to strip him naked in front of everybody. And that's what our psalmist is describing to us. This is the way he feels, this scoffing non-believer. He's not satisfied. That's, that's the thing. The unbeliever is not satisfied to just be left alone in his unbelief. He's, he's not happy just to not believe and, and everybody understand that he doesn't believe. That, that's not enough for him. He wants to, to argue and he wants to dispute and he wants to make everybody else who does believe ashamed that they believe. He wants to hurt everybody else who does believe. And so he's backing, trying to back David into a corner and he's ridiculing his faith to a point that he's trying to humiliate him. And why is he treating him this way? Why is he not just saying, I don't believe, just leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. But no, he's lashing out at David. He's lashing out at David because of his faith. You look at verse 42, and, and David says, you know, if you, if you give me that mercy and that salvation that you promised in your word, according to your word, so shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. And if you live a sincere Godly life, you will at times be on the receiving end as some of that kind of hatred, some of that kind of ridicule. People are going to try to embarrass you. People are going to try to mock you. Jesus said in John 15 and verse 18, he says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would try love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Thank God he chose us out of the world, right? Thank God for his choice. But he says, because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. They don't just want to sit alone in their unbelief and be left alone. They want to hate you because you do believe. The world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Right? Do we deserve to be treated better by the world than Jesus got treated by the world? Absolutely not. And we're not we're going to be, right? Jesus said, we, we don't deserve any better. Don't expect any better. He said, expect them to hate you. And in uh, Matthew chapter 5, he said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you. And I really, I, I studied this sermon like three weeks ago, Brother Nate, and it's got a lot of the same scriptures that you were talking about Sunday. Maybe the Holy Spirit is just on to something here, right? Maybe he knows what we need to hear because I do believe that suffering and persecution is coming upon Christians in America. I believe it's been happening throughout the centuries. Jesus warned us about it. But he said, blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. He, said, he doesn't say blessed are you if they revile you. He said when, when. It will happen and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. They're going to accuse us of all kinds of things. They're going to accuse us of, of misappropriation of funds and of, of abusing children. And they're going to accuse us of, of things that are false to try to disparage our name because they hate the message. Jesus said they'll rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. And here the psalmist is experiencing that very same kind of persecution. He's being ridiculed by a relentless scoffer who's trying to humiliate him, trying to shame him simply because of his faith. And his prayer is that the Lord will work so mercifully in his life that the Lord will manifest that great deliverance of his salvation in such that he's promised his word in such an obvious way that it cannot be denied. And when that happens... It's going to be the unbeliever who's standing there with nothing to say, not the believer. The, the believer is not going to be speechless. It's going to be the unbeliever who, who can't answer what Almighty God has done. Nothing to answer. So thirdly, now in this psalm, we have the priority of the believer. That's our third point, the priority. This is something that is woven throughout the fabric of this section here. In this psalm, really throughout the whole psalm, but throughout this section here, it, it, the, the psalmist speaks of it over and over again. What's important to him here? What is important? What is getting him through this attack of the unbeliever on his life, ridiculing him? What's getting him through this? What is helping him be strong and bear up 
un, uh, under all the shame is the promises that he finds in the Word of God. It's the Word of God that's keeping. And, and how he looks at the Word of God is so important here. He looks to the Word of God for all his answers and for all his help. And I'll take you through that. I want to show it to you. In verse 41, right, which we already read, he prays for his mercy, for God's mercy, and for his, God's salvation. And, and, and he says, those things are according to your word. In other words, these, these things that you have promised in your word. He looks to God's word for the things that God has promised him. He says, that's what's going to give me an answer. And so it's God's word here in the very beginning, verse 41. And then in verse 42, he declares that he trusts. Do you see that in verse 42? Trusts in what? God's word. I trust. He says, for I trust in your word. And in verse 43, he declares that he has hoped in God's ordinances. And it's not, uh, oh, I hope I get a Barbie for Christmas. I, I, hanging on to the slight possibility, it's a confident hope. I, 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 that's my hope that gets me through because I know that it's going to happen. It's a different kind of hope than we, the way we use the word hope. In verse 44, he declares that he will keep God's law continually forever and ever. And I like that. That's what I tell Bridget every morning. I will love you and cherish you continually forever and ever. <laughs> right? Okay. Continually forever and ever. I mean, that's, that's how you really say it's going to be a long time. And for eternity after that. Okay. He says, I'm going to keep God's law continually forever and ever. He, in verse 45, he declares that he seeks the Lord's precepts right that doesn't just come to you by accident right you need to seek God's word he's, he's he, he he seeks the Lord's precepts verse 46 he declares that he will speak of God's testimonies not do I, not only do I want to know God's word but I want to talk about God's word and, and shouldn't we do that shouldn't we declare God's word I'm going to speak of God's testimonies. Verse 47, he proclaims that he will delight himself in God's commandments. And then in the same verse, verse 47, uh, he, he goes on to declare that he loves those commandments. He says, I, I, I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. And then in verse 48, he declares that he will lift up his hands to God's commandments. And again, he, he declares that uh, in that verse 48, that he loves God's commandments. And then finally, in verse 48, he declares that he will meditate on the Lord's statutes. I'm just going to be sitting around thinking about the Lord's statutes. So in every single, there's not a verse in this section where he doesn't say something very cool about God's word and about his attitude towards God's word. Every one of these eight verses, the psalmist has declared at least one thing about how he loves God's word, about how he will seek to know God's word more. And in verse 47, he made two statements like that. And in verse 48, he made three statements like that. So for a total of 11 statements in these short little eight verses in this section, he has made 11 statements here which speak about how good the word of God is. And I think we get the idea that the Word of God was very wonderful to him and very important to him and very precious to him. So I think the question we ought to ask ourselves as we look at this is how important is the Word of God to you and me? Is it that precious to us? Uh, I've seen the videos of the people in China who were given the gift of like just a page of the scripture, maybe a page out of the Gospel of John, the third chapter of the Gospel of John, because they didn't have copies of the Word of God in this communist, anti-Christian persecution area of the world, and, and they're handed, and they weep as they take these things, and they just read over them, and they quote them, and they memorize just one little page of God's Word. Can you imagine the Word of God being that precious? Should we not take the Word of God ourselves that we have, we have Bibles, we have pew Bibles that we can put in every pew of our church. And if you don't have a Bible, somebody will, we have Gideons in this country that will give you a Bible. We have the Word of God. We are rich with the access to the Word of God. And we talk about persecution in our country, and we, I believe it's ramping up, and it's going to get worse. But right now, we have 
easy access to the Word of God. We can listen to it on the Internet. It doesn't cost us a penny to just get on the Internet and listen to the Word of God. Read it. Read the Word of God. Get your phone out. You can look at the Word of God. Thank God we have access to this precious thing. How important is the Word of God to you? Do you trust it? Do you love it? Do you desire to know more of it? Do you value it above other things in this life? Do you read it at all? Do you spend any... How much time do you spend watching a program on TV? And then compare that, how much time do you spend in God's Word? <laughs> yeah. Do you like it? Do you love it? Do you want some more of it? Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, our fourth point, now that I've ruined everybody's line of thought. The fourth point, the provisions for the believer. So we go through this. We're going to kind of look through now. I want you to think about the fact that there's a lot of prayer being lifted up here by the psalmist. I want you to understand that we're seeing these prayers answered here as we make our way through this section. He's praying, Lord, give me your mercy and your salvation so I'll have an answer. Okay, And then as we go through the psalm, as he prays for these things, the point is that all the answers to everything the psalmist is praying for he can find, he knows he can find these things in the Word of God. That's where the answers are. Um, and so there are five things we're going to see here. First of all, a merciful salvation. That's number one, a merciful salvation. He says, let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your Word. That, that never failing never-ending chesed covenant mercy that saves to the uttermost those who come to Him for all eternity. That salvation is revealed to us in the Word of God. We see the mystery of it in the Old Testament. It is unveiled to us in the story of a God who loved us so much that He would come down here in human flesh. Just think about it. The God who sat on the throne would come down here where He would stub His toe and get dirt and sweat in his face, and suffer, and die, and he, he, he loved us so much, he came down here in human flesh, and he took the punishment for our sins upon himself, in his own body on that cross, in our place, that gospel story is the very heart of this Bible that we hold in our hands today, and you can't read it, you can't study it, you can't meditate deeply and seriously about it without being overwhelmed that God would show such mercy and give such a wonderful salvation to sinners like us who just don't deserve it. But that's what he's going to find here. He said, give me that, those mercies your word promises. Give me that salvation. And he's going to find it here in the word of God. And secondly, he has a confident answer. Confident answers. And the psalmist speaks to us here as both one who would cry out to God for this merciful salvation and as one who would receive that merciful salvation. If the Lord will just answer and pour out that salvation upon him, the psalmist declares, so shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. If you'll hear my prayer, O Lord, pour out your merciful salvation upon me, then it really won't matter what my enemies say to me, no matter what they say, what they try to do to humiliate me, it just won't matter because, because your merciful salvation is everlasting. These worldly, wicked unbelievers are clinging to things that are temporary. They're putting their eggs, all their eggs, into the basket of this fragile, present world that's fading away but my trust is in you lord my trust is in your word your kingdom and i know that you will never fail you will never pass away so when the wicked try to shame me they try to make me look like a fool for following after jesus right they always attack the science and, and here's the thing i don't 
I don't understand. I'll just get into it for a second because I know we can't stay here all night tonight. But the world has always attacked the Bible. They've always talked about it like it, it just didn't have the science. And, and for centuries, they mocked it because if you read in the book of Job that uh, you, you find that there were creatures on this earth that were, are described that are like dinosaurs. And, and, and men knew about them. And so, so the world mocked the Bible and said, no such creature, there's no evidence that any such creature ever, it's a fairy tale. They're talking about dinosaurs and, or, or some kind of big reptilian type of dragon creature or whatever. And, and, and they, they mocked it. They said it just never existed until people started digging up fossils of dinosaurs. And then the science proved that the Bible was right. Now, though though the, the Bible doesn't need to be proved by science, but the science came out to show that the Bible was right about what it was saying about the creatures that walked on this earth, that men, and even though men had drawn them on cave walls for uh, many centuries ago, but the Bible said it all along. So then they just began to make up a new fossil record and they began to mock. And, and, and what they say now is that the, you know, the, the Bible is just ridiculously wrong because men could have never lived with dinosaurs because the dinosaurs lived millions and millions of years. And I believe what the Bible says is that this earth was created in six days by the power of a God who says, let there be an idiot's. That's what they don't want to believe. They don't want to believe in a God with that kind of power. They don't want to believe in a God with that kind of authority. And they say, we just don't believe the science. Well, my friend, it's not science to say it all happened by accident. You cannot look at this world and see the design of it. You cannot see us, this planet spinning around the sun and getting the summer and the winter and the fall and the spring you cannot see the 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 water that we need on this planet and the air that we need to breathe and the trees and and the shade and you know all the things that we need to live in this this planet be habitable god has designed it it's wonderful it's beautiful the light that we have from the sun during the day the lesser light that we have from the moon during the night all the different things that god has done are wonderful and and there's great design and it's beautiful and there's no way, there is no science, no science that, that is just not just idiocy that would say that God didn't create it, that it was, there's not great design in it all. This world is designed by a, an awesome genius architect. Awesome genius architect. And so, but they would call us a fool for believing that. <clears throat> But he says, David says, I'll have an answer, Lord, when you give your salvation. And, and in verse 43, he, he says, And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your ordinances. Lord, if you, if you were to withhold your merciful salvation from me, then I would have nothing at all, no good truth with which to answer my persecutors who are trying to, to shame me. So Lord, please don't leave me here with no answers for my accusers. Please don't leave me here on the playground telling them that my God, my Father is great, greater than what they're trusting in. Please don't leave me standing here saying that without any evidence to show them. Please show me that. By withholding your mercy and salvation, I would not be able to answer that. But Lord, if you'll pour that on, out on me, I can talk to them about how great my Father is. Pour it out on me, and I will be able to answer anything they throw at me. Thirdly, we have obedient liberty. And in verse number 44, he says, So shall I keep your law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. And even as Americans, we have a very flawed perception of what liberty is. Yeah. Our nation was born in a struggle for liberty. Most people think liberty, though, means being able to do anything you want. But do you understand that the American Revolution itself was fought not so people could do anything they want, not so they could get drunk and party and delve into all kinds of hedonism and, and, and sin, but rather the American Revolution was fought 
so that people in this country might have the freedom to worship God. And I want you to understand, no person is more in terrible bondage than the person who is enslaved in sin. The person who says, well, I'll do anything I want. I commit any kind of sin I want. I don't have to mind God. That person is enslaved more than anybody. And you cannot deliver yourself out of that kind of bondage. Sin becomes your master. Only Jesus can free you from the grip of sin by, by the cleansing power of His own precious blood. I also want you to understand that no person is so free as the person who willingly surrenders himself at the feet of the Lord Jesus to be His servant forever and ever. That is true liberty. That is the greatest freedom there is. So these verses speak of God's gracious work of, of sanctification that through the work of Christ, through the presence of the Holy Spirit within us, we can have liberty from sin. I will walk at liberty and we can be set free to walk in the paths of righteousness. We can never do it before. Right? Even in the 23rd Psalm, which is one of the scriptures children memorize very early. Before we walk in paths of righteousness for His namesake. Before that happens, first He has to restore our soul. So we have obedient liberty. Fourthly, we have bold assurance. And He says in verse 46, I will speak of your testimonies also before kings, and will not be ashamed. You ever uh, meet somebody important? And your wife says, don't, don't say anything. Just, just be quiet. Just meet him. Shake his hand and go on. <laughs> right? You meet somebody very important. And you just want to say something. You know any of, the, any of the believers in Scripture who stood before kings? And, and does the story say that they kept their mouths shut before those kings? Uh you, do we know any of these believers who stood before kings and talked about, spoke about the Lord's testimonies with an unashamed assurance? How about Abraham? How about Joseph? I mean, he was right there in, in, the, in, in the, the hall with the royalty there. How about Daniel before Nebuchadnezzar? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were right there. You know, they were accused, and, and Nebuchadnezzar was getting ready to throw them into the fiery furnace. Did they get quiet and ashamed? Oh, we're fixing to be in trouble. No. They, they said, uh, our God whom we serve is uh, able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and, 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 and He will deliver us from your hand, O King. But if not, let it be known to you, O King, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. They spoke before kings, unapologetic, unashamed. How about Jeremiah? How about uh, Paul on trial? And every time it seems like he just repeated that same old story about what Jesus did for him, right? All those things Jesus did for him. How about Jesus himself? Only time he was quiet and didn't open his mouth is when it came time for him to defend himself. He didn't open his, word, his mouth to defend himself, didn't say a word to defend himself. So all these men looked in the faces of kings. They boldly refused to compromise if it meant that they would have to be disobedient to God. So David says, I will speak of your testimony also before kings. I will not be ashamed. And then finally, and probably most appropriately, a satisfied love. A satisfied love. I think that describes my marriage more than anything. I will delight myself in your commandments which I love. Do we uh, ever kind of feel like maybe the Lord's commandments are burdensome? They're a duty to us? If you read the book of 1 John, it's not burdensome. It's not a, it's not a chore. He says it's a delight here. He says, I love your commandments, Lord. I love doing what you want me to do. So my hands also will I lift up to your commandments, which I love. And I will meditate on your statutes. I'm just going to sit there and think deeply about your statutes.
We're talking about a person who not only delights in obeying the Lord, but loves obeying the Lord. Isn't that awesome? It, it, so it's not a duty. It's, a, it's, a, it's something we love doing. Did you know you, in, a, in a marriage relationship, in really any kind of relationship, the more you serve the person you're in a relationship with, the more you love them and the more you love serving them. That's why I always encourage him, Bridget, to make me a root beer float and bring it to me. You know, she, she, the more she does that, the more she's going to love doing it, right? You know? okay. I'll shut up. <laughs> so really, the, the, uh, the question I think that we should ask ourselves tonight, how do we feel towards the Word of God? That's what we see all the way through this. The Word of God is so vital, so important. How important is the Word of God to me? How sure am I about this Christian life? If anybody comes to me and were to ask me why I follow Christ, what would I say to him? Well, I know one thing I could say is that he had mercy on me. He saved me. He showed me great mercy. You know, and you may not understand that, but I understand that, and that's a good answer for me. He saved me with a wonderful, merciful salvation. And how's your attitude towards what Christ commands us to do? Is it something that you, oh, I'm just so, oh, it's time to go to church again. Ah, oh, same old thing. Let's just go through the ritual and get it over with. Or do we love it? Do we delight in it? Do we love it? And I think we ought to. And I think that uh, the more we get into the Word of God, and the more we serve Him, the more we're going to. The more we're going to. And that's when you know, that's when you know it's real.